really excited to see you here tonight and excited about this program. When we got started 11 years ago, a few of us thinking that, you know, there should be a lot of interest in Newark history and we can encourage um, uh, ongoing research and uh, uh, the telling of Newark's uh, story. This is precisely the sort of event that we had in mind. But in due course, we would be able to give a bit of a forum in a public community setting like this to um, what we uh, call new historians tonight. I hope that's OK. Uh, but to graduate students working on topics in Newark's history and talking to uh, people who, will be, who are probably involved in the, uh, helping them with their research and can certainly ask questions and make comments to help guide it. That sort of feedback loop, that encouragement for more research, more ideas, is, is, is really an exciting development uh, for us. One of the ways that the Newark uh, History Society is encouraging that is through our Newark Archives Project. We are in year three, and where is Gail Malmgreen? Um, she's the, uh, the uh, head of it. We're doing this in cooperation with Rutgers Newark. Uh, with support from a number of you here, we've had more support from private individuals than from foundations or the public sector, but the uh, New Jersey Historical Commission has given us a third grant for that work. Uh, we expect to go live in the next month or two with a website. Uh, Natalie Borisovitz is, is nodding her head. She's already helping students use the, the, uh, the initial version of that website. Uh, but Gail and uh, Alex Ross and others working on that project have done a terrific job in this pilot phase identifying archival sources about Newark. Um, it's the only project of its kind in the country, and the whole purpose is to draw um, uh, scholarly and research interest in uh, Newark and its long and varied history. We, expo uh, we hope to expand it beyond Newark, to uh, repositories elsewhere in New Jersey and to New York, and if uh, we win the lottery, um, uh, go uh, national with it. Uh, but that's a few steps down the road. Uh, but when we do launch that website, we'll certainly let those of you who are on our mailing list know about that. Uh, Bob Hartman is sitting over there. Bob is the designer of all of our flyers. This is our 47th program. He has designed all of those flyers. He is also working on a website for the Newark History Society, and we are getting ever so close to that, aren't we, Bob? Uh, we, will, we will let you know when that is launched to uh, a number of the papers, a uh, few of the papers uh, uh, delivered at these programs will be on that site as well as each of those flyers, other information about the Newark History Society. To hear about that, you need to be on our list. It even helps if you're a member. Um, Warren have slips, they're out on the table out there. We have kept memberships at only $25 a year for, for the last uh, 25 years. We are an entirely volunteer-driven organization, <laughs> and we encourage you to um, uh, be part of this. I warn those of you who have only given us email addresses that, that Neanderthal that I am, I have finally figured out how to assign a PayPal account to um, to this website, and we will be able to solicit you for memberships as well, even if we don't have your address. That is coming. But thank you. We are, gosh, nearly 200 members strong um, and very grateful for the support that we've had over the years for the work of this society. Um, but again, tonight our focus is on um, new research related to Newark and I just want to uh, give real thanks to um, the support that we have received over the years from Rutgers Newark. I am thrilled that um, uh, former Chancellor Diner is here, who has, has been such an incredible supporter of all things Newark and for the academic efforts around Newark. But I would draw attention as well to others who are, who are overseeing PhD dissertations, Professor Timothy Raphael, um, Professor Robert Snyder over there, uh, uh, Professor Sherry Ann Butterfield, <coughs> Professor uh, Beryl Satter, Professor Alan uh, Sadnovic, and, and our uh, 
we all love him. Uh, Clement Alexander Price as well, who <laughs> has done so much. And this research is taking place through the Graduate Program in American Studies, which is tonight's uh, panel. Uh, also, the Department of History at Rutgers Newark and uh, the Institute on Ethnicity, uh, Culture, and the Modern Experience, again, the one that, that Clem heads up. Tonight's program um, is going to be introduced by Tom McKaig. Um, uh, Tom is a member of our executive committee, our informal in executive committee, where we meet over dinner and say, now what do we do? Um, he's a Princeton graduate. Uh, 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 a Rutgers PhD, he's the author of Miracle on uh, High Street, the History of St. Benedict's Prep, um, and he is also teaching the History of Newark course at, uh, at Rutgers Newark. Tom, do you want to introduce our program tonight? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tim, and uh, as Tim said, as co-founder of the Newark History Society with Warren Grover, tonight's program is near and dear to them as part of their founding vision and mission was to encourage uh, a new generation of scholarship on Newark. So we come together tonight to listen to Newark's new historians, an exciting panel of graduate students from the American Studies program at Rutgers Newark. Uh, we'll begin with some brief introductions of our four speakers. They'll come up one by one uh, and make their presentations. Uh, I will provide a brief comment uh, at the end of all four of those, and then we'll open the floor uh, to Q&A. Elizabeth Miola Aaron teaches a graduate seminar on teaching history at Rutgers Newark, where she also supervises student teachers. She taught high school history for many years, and therein lies her interest in what we teach and why we teach it. Elizabeth's Newark roots date back to the late 1800s, when her paternal grandfather arrived here from Italy and continue through her father's graduation from Westside High School. She spent many of her childhood Saturday mornings going to work with her father at his carpet supply warehouse on Shipman Street. Samantha Boardman's dissertation explores the cultural history of modern tourism as told through the American-themed tourist attractions. Samantha's Newark-based public scholarship includes a short documentary on the Prince Collection at the Newark Public Library, articles on the history of the Kruger Scott Mansion, and Castle Newark, a short documentary on the history of the mansion that has received over 80,000 views on YouTube. John Johnson Jr.'s dissertation, Zion, which cannot be moved, a study of the weak wake section of Newark, questions the death of the community narrative in ethnic succession scholarship during the Civil Rights and Cold War era. It examines the ways in which urban renewal transformed the broader cityscape of Newark. His personal story is tied to that scholarship. His family migrated from South Carolina to Weak Wake in the 1960s. In his spare time, which no longer exists because of his doctoral work, <laughs> John officiates and competes in fencing, a sport that has deep roots in the city of Newark. He's also a proud alumnus of St. Benedict's Prep, and I not only taught John, but taught alongside him in the Newark Studies program. Laura Troiano spends much of her time at Rutgers, where she works at the Institute on Ethnicity, uh, Race, Culture, and the Modern Experience. Aside from her graduate studies here, she will soon teach the popular Newark history course this summer. Though Laura truly loves history in Newark, her true passion is not baseball, the topic for her discussion tonight, but the New York Jets. <laughs> we all have crosses to bear in life. <laughs> Without further ado, our first speaker, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tom and Warren and Tim and everyone else who's come this evening um, to hear our stories. Um, my story starts... Well, it actually starts in 1904. It starts earlier than that, probably. But it's called To the Making of the Good Citizen. And the making of the good citizen is what John Cotton Dana and Frank Urquhart and J. Wilmer Kennedy and some other Norkers were talking about um, in the early 1900s when they were talking about schools in Newark. 
And I owe this to Tom McCabe. Tom McCabe um, said to me a couple of years ago, you should look at this NORC study. And I said, what NORC study? And he said, this thing, and he described it. And he didn't know that much about it, um, but he encouraged me to look at it. And I think what he was actually saying was, you are the only person dorky enough that I know who might be interested in this topic. <laughs> and indeed I am. And my friend Wendy, who is a fellow teacher, is shaking her head. I am indeed dorky enough to be interested in this topic. So uh, we begin in Newark in the Progressive Era, which, as every city in the Progressive Era, was dealing with the problems that rapidly building and industrializing cities were dealing with as hundreds and thousands of immigrants were coming to the cities for jobs at the turn of the century. Housing and transportation and, and the health and welfare of the residents and what to do with garbage and how to regulate work and industry and building codes and how cities should be governed. All of those issues were being talked about in Newark as they were across in the nation cities at the turn of the century about 100 years ago. And the progressive talked about, the progressives were talking about how best to build citizens in the city of Newark. And one of the ways they talked about doing that was uh, in the schools. And there are a lot of conversations about this in Newark at the turn of the century. And I need to emphasize here that I am at the very, very beginning of this process, where, quite frankly, I have many, many more questions than I do answers, some of which maybe will be answered by some of you this evening at the end of this talk. Um, there are um, multiple meanings for citizens, and um, that word means a lot to different people at the turn of the century, and that is where this title to the making of the good citizen comes from. So in the Newark public schools at the turn of the century, the average class size is 48. And that's a decrease um, from somewhere in the 50s or 60s. As of 1896, that's official board policy. The classes will not exceed 48 students. They do, almost immediately. Uh, by 1900, the North public schools find themselves about 3,500 seats short for students in the schools. Um, they embark on a building program of both elementary slash primary and uh, ultimately more secondary schools. In the first decade of the century, the population of the city increases by about 100 or so thousand people, including a lot of children, at the same time that the schools increase the maximum, the minimum age for exiting school to 14. So there are more children staying for longer, and there are no seats for them. Um, and so by about 1910, the schools find themselves about 10,000 seats short. So John Cotton Dana, because of course John Cotton Dana is part of my story. John Cotton Dana, who's in charge of the North Public Library, sees a lot of these children and their families, particularly on Sundays, because Sunday is not a day when factories are open in Newark, and it's a day when families are coming to the North Public Library, because the North Public Library is open on Sundays. And he finds that a lot of them have questions to ask, and he wants their uh, questions to be answered. He has papers at the North Public Library in foreign languages, he has books in foreign languages, he has a children's reading room, and he has um, a great kind of excitement that he talks about with the questions that people come in to ask at the North Public Library about their city, about its past, about its buildings, about its history, about its schools. And like his contemporaries in education and libraries, he sees that the library should be very much an extension of the school system, and that's something that we see in Newark in the early 20th century that I'll be talking about at some point later in my research. More importantly for my purposes tonight, he views printed material as a tool of social reform. And he sees this so much that in the lobby of the North Public Library, he has a working printing press. And he prints, as many of you will know, and Tim, I owe you a thanks for some of this, um, broadsides, pamphlets, posters, book plates, billboards, advertisements are all part of how John Cotton Dana views uh, addressing issues of reform and cultivating the citizenry and citizenship. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, which is why it's in the slides. It's not technically connected to schools. Um, this is one of his posters in the library about reading, um, which I have shared with my children, not surprisingly. Um, but I actually want to talk about it for just a moment because it actually helps get to one of the things that gets discussed in the city at the turn of the century, which is what should children be reading and why should they be reading it, which sounds like a very modern 2013 conversation. And it's a conversation that really polarizes educational reformers at the turn of the century, 
because they have very different views about what children should be reading. In particular, and I mentioned my grandfather very deliberately, uh, my grandfather and his brother both came as preteens or teens to Newark. Um, neither knew how to read, neither knew English, neither knew how to write, at least when they first arrived, and neither went to school. And so those are the children that these conversations are actually being had about, and that is of great interest to me. In particular, because the conversation becomes one about, do the children of factory workers need to read the classics? And some people say, yes, they do, for very particular reasons. One of those people is John Cotton Dana, at times. Other times, he contradicts himself, as he does on many topics. And J. Wilmer Kennedy, who is the assistant superintendent of schools, who writes my study that I'm really focusing on, uh, also sometimes says, yes, they should read everything, and they should have access to everything. And then he says, sometimes, no, they don't really need to. It's not going to be useful to them or practical. So my story really begins with three small pamphlets. In 1904, John Cotton Dana decides that the visitors to his library should be given or have access to some type of printed material that answers some of these questions. And so he asks Frank Urquhart, who is a newspaper man and journalist in Newark, if he will put together short pamphlets about the history of Newark that will answer some of these questions that the people tend to have when they come to the library. And so Frank Urquhart does. And what John Cotton Dana says is he's looking for this plan for making good citizens by giving the children a knowledge of their city, and thus they will have a consequent interest in it. He says, we can't expect the children to be interested in it if they don't know anything about it. The teacher in me thinks it's pretty logical, but many people don't see that connection. So he gets the Newark Board of Trade, the city's businessmen, to pay for the production of these pamphlets. There are three. They are called Early Days, Awakening, and Progress. And right there, we begin to see the way that these men at the turn of the century begin to organize the way they feel the history of Newark should be taught to the children. So Early Days is the first one. It's printed in 1904. It's about eight pages long. They sell them at the public library for five cents each. And the statistics here, I think, are actually pretty important. 3,000 of them are printed in the first print run by Breaker Printing Company, and they sell out at the North Public Library. I think that's kind of a neat thing. So at least two more print runs are made, and I'm saying at least because it's very important for me to communicate to you that, again, I have many unanswered questions. But it appears that multiple print runs are made, and those pamphlets be, uh, continue to be sold. The next two pamphlets, Awakening and Progress, it appears are not written until um, starting in 1905, but they're not printed until 1906 to 1907. Ever the self-promoter, John Cotton Dana makes great work of this. So on my next slide, uh, he submits his own press release to the New York Times. <laughs> I'm assuming the New York Times didn't come across to get the story. Uh, and I think this is kind of neat, because it does make the newspaper in 1904. So just within two months of the first brochure being printed, it's kind of made the news that this is an important thing coming out of the city of Newark to help its citizens and residents learn more about their city and their past. And although my husband told me I had too many words on my slides, um, I said, I know, I'm a history teacher, that's what we do. I think it's worth reading this one. This is from early days. And this is where Frank Urquhart and John Cotton Dana kind of set up their vision of Newark and how Newark should be taught to the children, to turn the children into good citizens. I'll bore you by reading it. It took a long time to make the city of Newark. The grim old settlers put their best energies into its beginnings, and their descendants worked quite hard to make it better still. All down the long line of Newark people since 1666, there has been steady and willing toil year by year, generation by generation, to build Newark up stronger, better, fairer. Now it is in our hands, those who have left, those who have gone have left the city to us. Shall we not? as the others have done before us, take the best care of it we can. Shall we not try to make it each year a more agreeable place to live in, more beautiful to look at, a source of pride to all who grow up in it, and share the good things, the fine streets, the parks, the trees, the schools, the public buildings, the beautiful homes, which men and women have worked hard for nearly 250 years to give it. And we'll just stay there for a minute. I've highlighted, as history teachers also tend to do, kind of those key themes, and these are the themes that are visited over and over in the Newark study. So those three pamphlets, 
by 1909 have been condensed into a book called The Short History of Nork. This is a picture of just the cover. Um, oh, yeah, that's the book. Um, and it's written by Frank Urquhart. So he takes those three pamphlets of about 24 pages and he turns them into this short book. Uh, the Newark Board of Education commits to buying 2,500 of them. And so 5,000 copies are printed and the school board puts it on their list of approved books to be used. So just to give you a sense of the topics, and I won't read the list, but these are some of the things that are expanded upon in a short history of Newark. And this is only chapter two. <laughs> Again, and kind of as funny as I think it is, it's also quite a commentary on what I think these men at the turn of the century are attempting to think about how you get children to think about where they live and what what has happened to make where they live what it is and what needs to happen with the next generation of citizens to continue this narrative of progress that we see in the Newark study. Um, there are some very big ideas and some very small topics. So then my question is, okay, so why was this thing written? And um, you can begin to see why it was written because people were talking about how, how to best turn people into citizens at the turn of the century, especially many of these new immigrants who were very much strangers to a place like Newark. Um, but what the teacher in me admires is shortly after having put these pamphlets and the Newark study together, John Cotton Dana writes an article about it for an education journal because he'd like to lay it out as potential pedagogy and teaching. And he argues, I don't really know if this works, if this is the way we build good citizens. He says, of all the knowledges and habits is the most effective teaching children about their city. I don't know. But he says, I think it's worthwhile to test it thoroughly. And so the Newark study becomes a way to work out whether or not this is how you best build citizens. So again, some mathematics is necessary because the printed matter is important and these things multiply rapidly. There are over 5,000 of the original pamphlets by this time. The Newark study has at least 5,000 copies in its first print run. There's an entire other sub-curriculum called Newark and the City Arts that's published separately. And then they take the Newark study, which remember came out of small pamphlets, and they turn it into small leaflets that are kind of self-contained on different subjects that can be used separately as teachers see fit. And as the teacher in me is proud to report, that's a common theme in the Newark study, as teachers see fit to use with their students. So by my math, there are now thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these printed things about the history of Newark and how to build citizens floating around the city, um, keeping Baker Printing Company in business for sure. So it gets uh, kind of even more interesting because then the Board of Education asks for public meetings because they'd like to hear from the citizens about what the citizens think should be taught in the schools, which is an interesting thing for a Board of Education to do in the early century. You have probably never been to a Board of Ed meeting where the Board of Ed says, what do you think we should all be doing in the schools? <laughs> so it's rather unusual to ask for that input, but they are asking, what should we be teaching and how should we be teaching it? And the actual form of that meeting is pretty interesting. It's a public meeting that's held in May 1910. Um, you can flip to the next slide, Tom, thank you. And the Committee on Instruction and Educational Supplies hold this meeting. And all around the room, they set up maps and posters and pamphlets and pictures and things. And they ask people for their input, which of these things do you think we should be kind of including in our school curriculum? Two really interesting things to me come out of that meeting. One is the Board of Education orders a hundred nine-foot square huge maps of the city on rollers to be used in classrooms. Um, huge things. And the second thing is they uh, order thousands of 12-inch, basically, blank maps for children to fill in about their city, their parks, their schools, their houses, as they're learning about Newark. This is significant and interesting because apparently no other American city's Board of Education had thought to do this in 1910. So Newark is, we think, I think, so far, it appears, the first. <laughs> I don't want to commit right now in public. Um, so, so now my question is, how does this actually get into the classrooms? How does this become the work of teachers? Um, and the assistant superintendents, who generally are the ones who do the dirty work in the district and supervise curriculum, writes a companion piece to Urquhart's book. 
And it starts to get complicated for the researcher because, among other things, his companion piece has two titles. Sometimes it's called Nork in the Public Schools of Nork, and sometimes it's also called the Nork Study, and that was the first one I think that Tom referenced to me. And this is mostly Frank Urquhart's book, kind of recast with lesson plans and curriculum suggestions, suggested reading, suggested activities for classes and for teachers to do. So to review, I'm good on time, like two more minutes? Okay. There are pamphlets written from 1904 to 1907. In 1910, those pamphlets become a much larger book by Frank Urquhart. In 1911, Frank Urquhart's booklet becomes Nork in the Public Schools of Nork, slash also called the Nork Study. I haven't even touched upon the fact that there's a reprinted version in 1953, smack in the middle of the start of the Cold War, uh, that's a school's edition reprint of the 1911 version. One thing I'll be looking at is, did those things change? My father, who was in high school in the late 40s and early 1950s, has zero recollection of any of this, <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, <laughs> but one of my questions is, was it used? And if it was used, to what benefit, to what extent, to what ends, for what means? There is also uh, something I have in my possession called the Nork Studies for grades 8 and 11, which was put together by a social studies educator in 1977. So if you'll just stay on that slide for one second um, before I finish with my last one, which has also too many words on it. So my story is about the story of Nork and to what extent people about 100 years ago thought the story of Nork was important enough to cast in a way, in particular, for the students and the teachers of the city. And in particular, for students who were not of Newark, who were mostly new to Newark, and who were not citizens in either a 2013 version of that word or in a way that we understand that word for 1910 or 1950 <laughs> or 1977. So those are some of the questions that I'll be looking at. My next slide is also a lot of questions which we're not going to take a look at. Those are my teacher questions. But the theme is, in many ways, this Nork study is a very progressive, very modern document. Right on the first page, the assistant superintendent suggests that you take the students up to the roof so that you can get a bird's eye view of the city and they can have a sense of the lay of the land of where they live. And he suggests this for the first graders, which if you know first graders, that's a cool thing. It's unsafe, obviously, <laughs> but, but still cool. But about two weeks ago, my first grader came home with homework, and his homework was to draw a bird's eye view of something they had done that day at school. And so in 1910 and in 2013, we're largely thinking about doing things kind of the same way with our children. This, I think, has some really interesting questions about how Norkers viewed themselves 100 years ago. Um, I think it will lead to some interesting research about how they viewed themselves going forward into the 21st century. And most importantly, it gets to, I think, the most important thing we can ask about our schools and the purpose of schooling, which is, and this is straight from J. Wilmer Kennedy, he argued that the early Puritan theocracy that develops in Newark morphs into the only form of government, democracy, uh, that more than any government in the world requires that its citizens should be educated because they are the rulers which I think is a remarkable thing to have said in 1910 about my Irish, or well, Irish and Italian grandfathers who were new and not <coughs> citizens and not literate. Um, and I think it will yield some interesting questions and answers about education in Newark in the 20th century. That's my work. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Samantha Boardman, and I'd just like to thank the uh, Newark Historical Society for including me on this panel. I'm delighted to be here. And I uh, just wanted to thank all of you for coming out tonight as well. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here, and that's a really big deal, so thank you so much. Um, I am going to keep my remarks brief because I'm going to be discussing an, a really amazing oral history archive that's being worked on right now at Rutgers Newark, and uh, I brought some audio clips from this archive, so I just kind of want to do my spiel and then get out of the way and let the voices from the archive tell their own stories. Uh, so this presentation focuses on the Kruger-Scott African American Oral History Archive that's currently being indexed in a joint project between the Center for Migration in the Global City and the American Studies Graduate Program at Rutgers Newark uh, with some very gracious assistance from the Newark Public Library. 
The archive, collected under the name The Lost Years Recovered, Oral Histories of African Americans in Newark, New Jersey, from 1910 to 1970, a continuum, documents the history of African American migration to and life in Newark during a time period for which primary sources of these phenomena were and remain scant. Catherine J. Lennox Hooker, the then director of the Kruger Scott Cultural Center, included the oral history project as part of a series of programs to promote restoration efforts then underway for the historic Newark landmark for which it is named. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Giles R. Wright, scholar of African American history and author of Afro Americans in New Jersey, A Short History, was retained to train volunteers from the community to interview their peers. So this is some, the, like the first thing that's really remarkable about this collection. Uh, people were interviewed by their peers, by members of the same community. And you don't find that uh, in, in many oral history collections at all. It's usually either top down, but that, I mean, this, this, is, this is significant. Uh, this resulted in a rich and evocative portrait of the evolution of African American life in the city over several decades of immense change. Next slide, please. The collection contains over 200 audio cassette recordings of interviews conducted between 1995 and 2000 with more than 100 residents of Newark, New Jersey, who lived in or migrated to the city between 1910 and 1970, with particular emphasis on the post World War II era. A 10 page interview questionnaire developed by Wright. Project consultant Dr. Clement A. Price and the citizen volunteers encompassed a wide variety of topics on which interviewees were encouraged to speak. And these are some pages from it here. Questions were divided into eight main categories, personal information, family background, migration to Newark, settlement in Newark, work, institutional activities, community life, and narrator's personal recollections of Louise Scott and the Kruger Scott Mansion. Migration to Newark, primarily from the southern United States, was at the heart of the interviews, with questions posed comparing and contrasting narrators' experiences with kinship networks, foodways, celebrations and holidays, employment opportunities, community relations with authority figures, and racial dynamics, and how these manifested in different regions of the country. Civic life in Newark was also examined through questions regarding political and social activism, neighborhood interactions, and education. The sheer scope of topics covered in the interviews, plus the ranges in age, occupation, and background of the narrators themselves, makes the archive a trove of primary source material. That's the other thing that's really remarkable about this archive. It's so incredibly comprehensive, and the questions that were asked to the narrators themselves just span an incredible range. A really amazing trove of information uh, from, from this community. Since 2009, the collection has been part of a cross-comparative oral history migration project spearheaded by the Center for Migration in the Global City in partnership with the American Studies Graduate Program at Rutgers Newark. In 2011, the Kruger Scout portion of the prototype was spun off into its own project. All 200 plus audio cassettes were digitized, their metadata logged, in, and the digital audio entered into a separate interclipper project to be segmented, annotated, and coded for indexing by graduate students from the American Studies program. And what that means is that unlike uh, traditional collections where you would just have typed transcripts and then you would have to search through transcripts and hope that somebody indexed them in a way that was useful to a researcher, uh, what the software allows you to do is actually index the audio itself. So if you're a researcher or a layperson or someone who's studying this community and their history in Newark, you would go and you could type in a keyword, uh, I'm interested in food, and it would pull up the actual audio in, in these interviews so that you could hear people describe uh, the different types of food that they encountered at different places along the journey, or how they couldn't get the kind of greens that they were used to uh, in the South when they came here, or how they could. But it's, it's the voices themselves instead of just the transcripts. So you hear the hesitations, and you hear the emphasis, and you hear the, the passion, and you hear the, the the inflection, and it just brings it to life, and it's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> due to a paucity of phys physical written transcripts created during the initial Kruger Scott oral history collection, this represents the first time these oral histories have been worked with since being shelved following the unfortunate demise of the restoration effort in the early 2000s. So there's only about 17 actual written transcripts for this, and what this initiative hopes to do is enable uh, a much greater use and um, uh, a facility with, with this collection through the audio itself. 
In December 2012, academic journal Vandal featured photos and transcript selections from the collection in their Food and Migration issue, introducing a new generation of scholars to this treasure trove of personal historical recollections. Uh, slide four, please. Okay, so my little bit is almost done. Um, so I just want to play a couple clips at this point uh, so you can get just a, a brief taste of, of what, what is, is in this collection. So the following interview clips give a brief taste of the power of the oral history form to convey sweeping historical conditions on a human scale. Here, narrators discuss life in a segregated United States through their memories of food and travel. And I'm just going to go over what the clips are real briefly. I'll play them, I'll summarize, and then, then I'm done. Uh, Alberta F. Reynolds, interviewed by Anne-Marie Dickey Kemp on May 27, 1997, discusses migrating to Newark from Laurenburg, North Carolina via segregated rail travel. The second clip features an unnamed narrator recounting her own experience with segregated bus travel from the South. Similarly, <coughs> elected official Mildred Crump, interviewed by Glenn Marie Brickus on November 12, 1996, describes her own experience with segregated travel during childhood trips from Detroit to visit relatives in the South. And in the last clip, Glenn Marie Brickus, herself interviewed by Magdalene Little on February 28, 1996, discusses her surprise and disappointment at the de facto segregation she found upon arrival in Newark in an anecdote about being refused service in a downtown restaurant. So we'll just play them. Uh, you can listen and then, then I'll summarize. And this is just a fraction of, of the fascinating anecdotes and descriptions of the lives of African-American migrants to Newark 
who came largely before the turbulence of the late 60s that has become, for better or for worse, a hallmark of the city in the collective imagination. These first-person accounts evoke the experience described by Walter Benjamin, whereby the past itself can be seized only as an image which flashes up at the instant when it can be recognized and is never seen again. While statistics and secondary sources may ably describe the history of African-American migration to Newark, these narratives, with their inflections, hesitations, and deeply personal stories, tell what it felt like. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I want to thank the Newark History Society for providing this forum for myself and my colleagues to present our, our work. Um, I think it's kind of fortuitous for, for my presentation to be positioned here because a lot of uh, what came out of those recordings that Sam presented uh, rings loudly in my ear just in terms of the stories that my family told me about their uh, journey to Newark. Uh, coming up on the, as my mom called it, the Silver Mita but it's actually the Silver Meteor uh, <laughs> from Sumter, South Carolina to Newark. And uh, I remember many summers going back down south myself with uh, brown paper bags of fried chicken and cake <laughs> and uh, bottles of knee-high soda. So uh, it does uh, ring loudly. Um, I'm that old, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, part of my work stems from uh, some silences in history. Uh, and looking at the history of Weequake, uh, a lot of the stories tell the story of the beautiful community up until 1967. And then after the riots, it all goes to piss. And my question was then, well, what happened afterwards? Uh, I spent four of my years there. Uh, my family spent a significant number of, of years in Weequake. Was it really all that bad after they left? And so my larger work really looks at uh, the changes that occurred um, after the riots. Uh, what I want to present to you tonight are some of the structural things that occurred uh, in the nation, but all, more specifically in Newark, that led to the changes in Week Wake. Uh, so to start, I'll look at a 1961 news article. Uh, 1961, the Newark News featured an article titled Week Wake Troubled Eden. According to the author, the residents of the predominantly Jewish community were, quote, afraid that the tree-lined streets may soon become unkempt, uh, that the nice homes will decay, and that the good schools will deteriorate. Close quote. Weak wake Jews saw themselves as, quote, victims of one of the great social maladies of the age. Close quote. Uh, this paper will look at two basic things. Uh, one, what caused the changes in Newark, the structural, economic, and political changes in the 1950s and 60s, and why did communities like Weak wake experience blight? I will examine different visions of a post-World War II Newark. One vision was held by Louis Danzig who through his position as executive director of the Newark Housing Authority sought to reverse the trend of middle class departure from Newark to the suburbs uh, through his plans and slum clearance and the elimination of blight. On the other hand, Lee Johnson, through his weekly column in the New Jersey Afro-American, American imagined a new Newark where the notion of middle class space was inclusive. Uh, by considering their different imaginings of Newark, I will show why communities like Weequake, an early suburb that was the model of suburban development, came to be threatened by blight. Now the weak wake section was established, you can go to the next slide, and it, uh, was established in 1910, in the 19-teens as a suburban residential enclave outside of Newark's older center city communities. Uh, communities that were overcrowded uh, tenements, uh, had poor plumbing and sewage, uh, cobblestone streets, and high rates of illness. Frank Bach, Newark's former postmaster and the proprietor of the weak wake park track, designed the neighborhood with uniform plots installed utilities like sewers, electric lines, and sidewalks, and mandated exacting building standards uh, on the slightly graded hills overlooking Weequake Park. In contrast to the crowded commercial and industrial hubs in the central city, Weequake was built as a quaint and serene suburb, a quaint and serene neighborhood, quote, one of the handsomest park developments in Essex County. Accessible residential property outside, oh, sorry, opposite large public breathing places is bound to become extremely valuable with natural upbuilding of the city, close quote. So you can go to the next slide. Um, what I want to show right now are a series of postcards. Uh, in the early 20th century, postcards were used somewhat like brochures to invite individuals who may not have lived in that area to come to cities. Uh, in this particular case, this set of postcards was used to 
generate interest in moving into the Weequay exception. And so the first one you have here is the Dividend Hill Monument. Uh, where the monument is actually built was a, tr a tree was established, was planted there to mark uh, the dividing line between Elizabethtown and Newark in the uh, early 18th century. <coughs> Uh, that particular monument was actually built in 1916 to commemorate the 250th anniversary of uh, the founding of Newark. Let me go to the next one. Um, actually, go re back real quick. I almost forgot. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here, if you see all this shrubbery around here, those trees actually didn't exist uh, at the time. Uh, it's kind of like clip art. Uh, they, a lot of the photographs were actually, they were hand painted, and the artists actually put little things in here to give it a different feel. And so if you can imagine a, a very busy street corner where there were a lot of power lines and a lot of cars on the, on the corner in the streets, uh, on the postcards, they would get rid of some of the cars, get rid of all the power lines to present a much nicer picture of the community. And so in this case, they put a lot of trees there to give it somewhat of a solemn, uh, reverential space. Let's go to the next one. Uh, in the next slide, we see here uh, two young ladies uh, walking along a path next to uh, We Quake Lake. And again, this is a very interesting contrast to what we know of early 20th century Newark. Uh, some people called it the most unhealthy city in the United States. Uh, one thing to bear in mind here and keep in mind are the boats here, because we're going to see a, a lot more of those in the next slide. So we can go to the next one. Uh, here, another contrast to uh, downtown Newark, uh, the Rose Gardens in Weekway Park. And uh, based on some of the interviews that I, I, I did with some former residents, these were in the park up until the 1960s. Now, I like, uh, I like this postcard a lot because there are a lot of different things going on. Again, you see uh, folks in a boat, kind of giving this idea of Weequake being a place for recreation, uh, where you can go uh, for leisure fun. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, particularly with capitalism, uh, with consumer culture emerging, uh, that was something that if you had enough disposable income to do, you, you participated. But in the background here, you see the Waverly train station. It's a little obscure, but you can see it here. And then you see two cars here, one being a actual, not a passenger car, but a commercial car. And so there's a juxtaposition of this uh, recreational space and suburban space to be sure, but also an industrial marker as well to let you know that this was part of the city of Newark. Um, these are my readings to be sure. Um, and then behind the cars, you see a little house. Well, actually, it's a big house uh, upon a hill. And so you see the juxtaposition of three different things. Uh, the recreational aspects of Weequake and Weequake Park, industrial Newark to let folks know that this was part of the city, but then you also have the house to reaffirm that this was a residential space. You can go to the next one. And the next one kind of follows that same strand. However, it emphasizes something a little different than Newark's industry as much as how much money can be made. I would venture to say that all of these Model Ts and other cars were not in the original photo. Of course, you see uh, uh, two couples in a boat uh, I guess having a uh, fun Saturday afternoon, uh, but in the back you see these Model Ts emphasizing uh, the idea of uh, Weekway being a place of people with a lot of money, uh, the better sort of people. Um, and in this one, uh, Weekway was known for a lot of its races, in this case uh, trotting races, there were also automobile races here, uh, Ulysses S. Grant in the 1870s actually rode horses here. Uh, one thing to note that this is a very gendered space. Only men are here on the side of the uh, race course. And in my larger work, I talk a little bit about how Week Week was a very much a gender space, especially uh, in the ways uh, individuals established their homes and built their communities. So we'll go to the next one. All right. Uh, anticipating some of the uniform design requirements of the mid-century uh, suburban subdivisions, uh, Frank Bach required precise construction guidelines, as you can see right here. Uh, quote, one house allowed on each plot, no houses more than two and a half stories high, no flat roofs, houses to be built uniform distance from the street line, close quote. Bach was aware of the problem of overcrowding and wanted to maintain Weak Wake as a low-density community. Yet he also wanted to allow middling Newarkers the opportunity to move on up. And as such, he zoned the community. Weak Wake's premier streets that abutted the park were, quote, restricted to one-family houses. Bach permitted the building of two-family homes on streets that were out of view of the park. Following the practice of real estate boards and harmonious groups, supposed in harmonious groups like blacks and Jews, were initially barred from buying homes in Weequake. There was no national standard for residence, residence appraisal during the first two decades of the 20th century, but local realtor boards used racist and classist beliefs to support residential segregation and bar those supposed inharmonious groups from middle-class neighborhoods like Weequake. 
Bach and his associates imagined a community open to Christian, middle class, and upwardly mobile white Americans. Now that all changed in 1927, when Beth Israel, a Jewish hospital, busted the block of Lyons Avenue and Osborne Terrace, bringing not only a Jewish medical staff, but also the businesses that cater to the needs of an expanding Jewish constituency. Over the next four years, the number of Jewish families entering Newark's southernmost community increased at such a pace as to warrant the erection of a high school. And in 1933, Week Wake High School opened its doors. Over the next 30 years, Week Wake became a distinctly Jewish community that was a launching pad for middle class Jewish families and a small but growing number of African American families. In 1950, there were 53,315 people living in, in Week Wake, 52,011 of whom were Jewish and 1,269 of whom were black. Now, while Week Wake residents were engaging in what uh, Week Wake High School alumnus Sherry Ortner calls classing acts, the city at large struggled with the problem of decentralization. From 1938 to 1944, the city lost $300 million in assessed valuation. The city planners pointed out that Newark slums were a significant drain on the city's resources, with 31% of the units below, quote, the generally accepted minimum standards of health and decency, close quote. African Americans occupied almost all of these tenements that were located in Newark's third ward, and they paid high rents for shoddy quarters. The call for wartime workers drew even more workers to Newark, uh, thus increasing or expanding the overcrowding problem. World War II temporarily jump-started a stagnant economy wracked by the Great Depression. But the end of the war and the return to a peacetime economy promised an economic slowdown. The federal government on a macro level and cities on a micro level faced a shortage of housing, a decline in manufacturing, falling property values, diminishing revenues from a loss of tax dollars, and, a return to, and the return of thousands of American GIs. And then on July 14, 1949, the United States Congress passed and Harry, President Harry Truman uh, signed into law the Housing Act of 1945 uh, as one of the methods to avert an economic slowdown. Now, the legislation emerged out of a series of hearings. I'm not going to get into the particulars of the Housing Act, but I want to just pinpoint a few things that are important. Uh, the legislation emerged out of a series of hearings in Congress at the conclusion of World War II. The speakers at the hearings included housing officials, executives, and managers from the banking industry, capitalists, and real estate officials. Their concern was not over the production of housing, or not just over the production of housing, but also the mass production of a consumer lifestyle in the early years of the Cold War. The Housing Act allowed for limitless production of housing in the private market, but rationed the amount of public housing produced. It provided for the general welfare of working and middle class suburban residents, but created conditions that constrained the choices of poor and working class residents in the city. It was restricted liberalism. In 1948, the Newark Housing Authority, NHA, under the stewardship of Louis Danzig, was appointed local arbiter of federal urban redevelopment and renewal initiatives. Louis Danzig grew up in Newark's third war during the 1920s and attended Central High School. He eventually graduated New Jersey Law School and passed the bar in 1930. Danzig took courses in housing at Columbia, NYU, and the New School, and upon graduation started working at the Newark Housing Authority. Anticipating the passage of the Housing Act of 1949, Danzig, quote, had his legal staff prepare an ordinance making NHA the city's official redevelopment agency, close quote, and city commissioners approved this. Danzig's goals were very clear. He wanted to build middle class housing and commercial, de commercial development in Newark. To achieve this, he orchestrated Newark's redevelopment in a, quote, unquote, non-political environment where non-local participants like the Urban Renewal Administration, the Federal Housing Administration, and private developers were at the table, but local interests like community groups were excluded. Clearance plans and project developments were secured by the time the public was notified. And his methods were effective. Quote, only two other cities of comparable size, that being Norfolk, Virginia, and New Haven, Connecticut, bettered Newark's achievements. And by 1960, Newark spent 5.4 million federal dollars and reserved almost 35 million for the development of projects through the 1960s. Danzig received both regional and local recognition for his work in urban renewal, notably the Newark Citizens Housing Council, interestingly enough, the Newark branch of the NAACP, and the Congregation of Young Israel named him Man of the Year in 19, I believe it was 58. From 1949 to 1960, NHA initiated nine clearance projects, and this is where the Danzig's, uh, I have yet to, in my work, I don't want to make him a villain because I think he went, to, went forward with the best intentions. However, the impact of urban renewal uh, leaves some questions, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. From 1949 to 1960, NHA initiated nine clearance projects, seven of which displaced Newark's residents. 
Development projects were zoned so as to create quote unquote natural boundaries around Newark central business districts. Residential and commercial development occurred in areas that were near next to the downtown. Light commercial and institutional development created a ring around middle class development in the center of the city, thus creating buffer zones between the center of downtown or downtown center and the rest of the city, um, which was Newark's mostly mo Newark's private housing market, which included Weak Way. Now, under Danzig's leadership, NHA was supposed to eliminate blight in the central ward through some clearance. Instead, it dispersed slum conditions into Newark's private housing markets, including Weak Way. Under the auspices of the federal government, NHA used Title I urban renewal funds to clear large swaths of land deemed obsolete. It destroyed more housing units than it built. NHA did not distinguish irreparably old structures from those that could actually be fixed. And so beneath the veneer of obfuscating terms like slum and blight, there existed valuable community institutions like black churches, social clubs, and even Jewish and black store, uh, store, black owned storefronts. Uh, urban renewal, often called Negro removal, displaced African American families and businesses and forced those who could not be rehoused in public housing to relocate into residential communities outside of the Central Ward. In March 1958, Louis Danzig attended a seminar at the Newark Museum held by the area's National Council of Jewish Women. An audience member asked Danzig about the incidences, quote, in fringe areas where one family buys a house and four families move in, close quote. Danzig retorted that he supported the administration of building codes which banned such practices, but he and members of the audience came to an agreement that they were not thoroughly enforced. Enforcement of zoning codes were lax for many reasons, one of which being that subdivided homes provide a space for families displaced by slum clearance in the central ward. Many persons on the Newark Council believed that NHA was the quote-unquote Negroes agency, one that, quote, hastened the racial invasion of white areas, close quote. And so by 1960, weak wage Jewish population declined to 37,538 persons. Conversely, the African-American population did increase to 9,136. Now, not everyone saw the influx of blacks as pre into predominantly white areas as an invasion. Lee Johnson began writing his weekly column inside Newark in 1959 for the New Jersey Afro-American. The author moved to Newark's Clinton Hill section in 1950, and over the course of nine years, became involved in neighborhood organizing, especially with the growing African-American community. They began to organize because, quote, the lifting of rent controls in the late 1950s had set off a wave of rent gouging, an apartment subdivision in Clinton Hill section just as hundreds of families, mainly black, were being displaced by crude bulldozing policies of the Newark Housing Authority in the Central Wharf, close quote. Johnson was pressed to address these matters because he believed the city's emphasis seemed to focus on downtown big business rather than the needs of the residential communities. Readers of Lee Johnson's weekly column understandably believed that Johnson was a Negro. N Lee Johnson, however, was the nom de plume for Stanley B. Winters. <laughs> now, Winters was president and co-founder of the Clinton Hill Neighborhood Council, a history professor at the Newark College of Engineering, and the Education Committee Chairman of the Newark Branch of the NAACP. Winters was also Jewish. Now, why did Stanley Winters take the pen name Lee Johnson? This was not politics and blackface. The idea for Inside Newark emerged from Winters' work with the Citizens Committee for a Better Group Relations, an interracial group. Winters' affectation for Lee Johnson was of a middle class black man. More, the name Lee Johnson hints at the birth amongst the pines of South Carolina, or another font of the Southern diaspora, thus subverting what historian James Gregory calls the framework of low expectations that shaped Northerners' expectations of black migrants from the South. This dynamism was not an indicator of any philosophical ambiguity on Winters' part, but rather of political dexterity. Winters was pragmatic. He perceived that Newark's political establishment doubled down on racist discourses, which made urban, black, poor, and slum transposable terms in the post-war period. As Lee Johnson, Winters exposed the utility of such discourses to business interests. Which has situated the struggles of black Newarkers as one of the multiple fronts in the civil rights movement, thus casting racial and class discrimination as a national problem, not just a southern one. In Winter's estimation, Jim Crow was present in Newark. In, June, in a June 1961 column, Winters posed the quandary, quote, while courageous men and women are blazing new frontiers for democracy in the South, is democracy being, being threatened in the North? Close quote. His column ran for five years, and through Inside Newark, Winters sounded calls for popular participation in Newark's political machine. Like Danzig and the NHA, Winters analyzed the esoteric idiom of federal, state, municipal policies and practices and rehashed it for lay audiences when dailies like the Newark News did not. He 
The announced dates and times for Newark's council meetings and public hearings and implored his readers to attend. These efforts paid off in the 1962, uh, paid off. In 1962, Winters and the Clinton Hill Neighborhood Council successfully blocked slum clearance projects that NHA planned for Clinton Hill. The plan called for the raising of a 14 block area in Lower Clinton Hill, an area that contained two and three family homes that were mostly populated by African Americans. Despite this small victory, Jews and even middle class blacks continued to leave Clinton Hill in weak way. Indeed, many were forced to leave. In 1957, the New Jersey State Highway Department proposed building an interstate highway that would run from the Holland Tunnel to western New Jersey and Pennsylvania through Newark. The 59-mile highway, which would be designated Interstate 78, bisected the weak wake section. Residents unsuccessfully fought against the proposal. Ethel Satcher, a Jewish woman whose son owned a drugstore <coughs> in the planned path of the highway, said that her neighborhood began to go down, quote, about three years ago when talk of the highway was strong, close quote. The plan seemed inevitable and a lot of people moved out, rented their homes, and what has happened to the community, in her words, is a disgrace. Business has fallen off, close quote. To be sure, Interstate 78 was not part of Danzig's urban renewal plan. However, the highway along with Interstate 280, which cut through North Newark, were federally funded ventures that provided residents from the suburbs of western New Jersey direct arteries into Newark's commercial and in industrial districts without having to traverse the streets of an increasingly black city. Construction of I-78 led to the clearance of nine blocks in Weequake. 469 homes and 100 businesses were raised. For those Weequake residents not forced to move, the construction of Interstate 78 cut a channel straight through the community that forestalled easy navigation between the north section and the south section of Weequake. And so by the end of the long cold winter of 1967, months before the riots, the New Jersey State Department of Transportation issued notices of demolition to residents and businesses on 14 streets in the Weequake section. Van White, an African-American man, owned White's Cleaners, which was located at 50 Watson Avenue, one of the streets that was going to be raised for I-78. He and his wife, May, lived in an apartment above their business. White ran his dry cleaning business for 18 years, and when asked to consider the impact of I-78 on his business, he simply rep replied, quote, this interruption is killing the poor man, close quote. By 1970, 4,397 more people lived in Weequake. They lived in a neighborhood with fewer homes and their children attended crowded schools that operated on a split day session. Half the students attending school in the morning and the other half attending in the afternoon. Urban renewal and other state funded projects like I-70 altered the urban landscape and the lives of Newark residents to the benefit of Essex, Morris, and Union County suburbanites and downtown corporations. In the end, Lewis Danzig and the Newark Housing Authority under the auspices of the National Housing Acts failed to accord Weequake and Newark's black population the securities extended to suburban residents. Thank you. Thank you Tough acts to follow today. Um, thank you all for coming and more. Thank you for staying even after the sandwiches were gone. It starts with a shout. You have to be kidding me. Then another. What? No way. And then you hear it from the upper deck. Something that is R-rated. The decibel level increases, it's ascending rapidly. Soon the noise blankets the whole stadium, and in that moment it could not be more clear. In all the variations of words encircling the stadium, there is an agreement. The umpire is legally blind. There is, <laughs> there is no universe where a man with sight would call him safe at second. Something happens when you're in a stadium. It's as if the outside world suspended and life's concerns shift. Here you live and die by the swing of the bat, the arm of the pitcher, the glove of the fielder, and the eyes, 2020 or not, of the umpires. On what was once situated on the lowlands bordering the Passaic River, in the ironbound section of Newark, in a neighborhood defined by its railroad tracks and its industrial buildings, but also for its primarily European immigrant inhabitants, on that lot of land there was a baseball stadium. See that up there. From 1936 to 1948, this stadium was home to two minor league baseball teams, the Newark Bears, an all-white New York Yankee farm team, and the Newark Eagles, a member of the Negro Leagues. It was inaugurated as David Stadium, it had a short stint as Bears Stadium, and it finally settled on Rupert Stadium. In the era of Jim Crow in Newark, a city that is often and unfairly so defined by racial unrest, Rupert Stadium was a shared space. It was a space that brought all citizens from all ethnic groups to its doors, well, its turnstiles. It was a space that all Newark residents could call their own, their own neighborhood stadium. 
If stadium's function is a space where one reality disappears and another is created, then Rupert Stadium produced a space where one could temporarily transcend the racial inequality that existed in the city and reside within the community created within those stadium's walls. The walls of Rupert Stadium are gone now. They are torn down in 1967, but the community it held and the many meanings it encapsulated, they still live. Well, at least the city of Newark hopes they do. Tonight, I would like to think about why someone would build a stadium in the legacy of another. And through that legacy, how could we understand both the past and the present? Next slide, please. My relationship with Rupert Stadium began at 450 Broad Street, sandwiched between Route 21 McCarter Highway and Interstate 280, right, down that way. Um, it was not love at first sight. It's not the prettiest stadium I've ever seen in my life. In fact, I had no idea that the stadium I passed every day on my way to and from work was built as an homage to Rupert Stadium. I'm, of course, talking about what you see here, Bears and Eagles, Riverfront Stadium. There are some differences between the two stadiums, but for, the most, for us tonight, the most important difference would be what space this stadium would be. This space would not be one that is segregated. This space would be one of communal camaraderie, one where we can all root for a hometown team. Go Bears? Yeah, go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> They're awful. You've got to support your team. It's ridiculous. I'm a Jets fan. I know what this means. <laughs> Rupert Stadium was not officially se sanctioned as a segregated space, but it operated by and large as one, where most of the city came for the Bears games and the African American community came for the Eagles games on the days that the Bears were all for having a weight game. This new 20th century stadium would not be segregated or rotated. As then Mayor Sharp James said on opening day, quote, let history say that we started with two separate teams. Now we will have a team that will mirror both the Eagles and the Bears, brought about by black and white, Republican and Democrat, urban and suburban, athlete and not athlete, end quote. That's all he said, nothing about corruption. <laughs> we'll get to that, we'll get to that. The city imagined that this stadium would act as both a remembrance of Newark that loved baseball, but also a city with a deep united sense of community. The city, through the stadium, attempted to regain that sense of community, and by doing so, take another step away from its tumultuous past. Next slide. So here we have two stadiums. One remembered as a sacred space, a space that allowed for ownership and transcendence, a space that served as a communal focal point, and the other, in, in a little over 10 years, I have found to be considered evidence of the city's poor planning, their economic inabilities, to say it kindly, and a structure completely out of sync with the needs of the city. This new stadium has failed in both its ability to foster a community and also the basic ability, as you all know, to bring people to the ballpark. Juxtaposing these sta two stadiums have left me with a lot of questions. What memories are trying to be invoked with the building of this stadium? Do these memories have any residence now? And why has it been such a failure? I would like you to think about these two stadiums in the way that Christopher Gaffney describes them as more than structures in an urban landscape. Stadiums, and I quote, are related to larger political and economic social processes. They are barometers of these changes and that by looking at stadiums as places and spaces of cultural process, sites and symbols of a dynamic social interaction, they are a way to gain unique insight into who and we and, we and what others are, end quote. Using this model, we could see how Rupert Stadium is how Rupert Stadium is being invoked in the new stadium, the way memory is strategically deployed as a means of community renewal and urban revitalization. We can use this new stadium as a way to view the history of the city and the changes that have taken place in Newark. Next slide. In order for you to get a sense of why people thought it might be a great idea to invoke the memory of the Bears and the Eagles in Rupert Stadium, I would like to give you a quick overview of the three. As I said before, Rupert Stadium had two other names. The one that stuck was given to the given to the stadium by its most famous owner, beer baron and former New York Yankee owner, Jacob Rupert. The stadium was completed in 1926, and as, as I said, it was demolished in 1967. During the 12 years that the two teams shared the stadium, there were a few years that the Bears were the sole inhabitants. The New York Bears won two Junior World Series and appeared in two others. They also won in 1932 before the Eagles got there. And the 1937 Bears are literally considered to be the greatest minor league team in history. There's an entire book just on 1937 Bears. That's the team right there. And that's Yogi Bear right there. Also played for the Bears. Get him in. To understand what the team meant to the city, I defer to acclaimed sports writer Jerry Eisenberg. 
because I think he captured the city in the heyday of the bears. I think there's some agreement here. And I quote, on summer nights, you could pick a block in the city, any block, and in a world without air conditioning, you can hear the sound of Earl Harper's play-by-play -play through the open windows. Walk the length of that block and not miss a pitch, end quote. <laughs> the bears are what the whole neighborhood was talking about, more of the whole city, and in season, everybody was tuned in to what was considered to be the most important event of the day, an event they hope ended with a box score and the bears victorious. Next slide. Here's our other hometown team, the Newark Eagles. They won the Negro League World Series in 1946 and finished in at least third place 10 out of the 12 years they played at Rupert Stadium. Five of the players' owners and the team owner, five of the players and the team owners, Ephraim Manley, are in the Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. I checked just last year. The Eagles are often described not only as a great baseball team, and they were a great baseball team, but it is an integral part of the African American community in Newark. Ministers, after blessing their congregation, will wish them a good time in the game they soon they knew they soon would be attending. Hall of Fame Newark Eagles pitcher Leon Day said, quote, Sunday in Newark in the 1930s and 40s was church and a doubleheader. Everybody dressed to the nines. The ball game was the centerpiece of Sunday, and we were, ba we were the backbone of Sunday, no matter where we were playing, end quote. Famed poet and writer Amiri Baraka describes his experience in watching the Eagles, end quote, in flying around the bases and sliding and home runs and arguments and triumphs, there were more of ourselves in the celebration than we were normally ever permitted. It was ours, end quote. Who wouldn't want to capture the sentiment held for these two teams and make a profit from it? Next. Okay, this brings us back to the new stadium, Bears and Eagles Riverfront Stadium. It's not spoken about with the same endearments. Not far from where Rupert Stadium once stood, there were plans to build another stadium in the Iron Dome. It would also include the construction of a 12,000 seat soccer stadium. The residents of the neighborhood fought passionately against this building and won. The compromise was that Essex County would help fund a downtown stadium, the stadium, and in exchange, the lucky city of Newark would get a new jail within its city limits. Congratulations. Okay, so I got more good news, don't worry. What started out as an estimated cost of 22 million, more than any other minor league baseball stadium at the time, ended up costing the city and Essex County $34 million, with the city and the county, regardless of whether the stadium is occupied with the team, paying $1.2 million through 2029. Yes, congratulations. It was touted as a linchpin for Newark's downtown re redevelopment. It would be a, in addition to NJ Pack, to Rutgers Business School, to the Prudential Center. It was supposed to be a money genera generating enterprise. It is an economic black hole. Whole. And that's just the stadium. Rick Cerrone, former New York Yankee catcher and original owner of the Newark Bears, wanted to build a team that would mirror the, the old Bears, the jewel of the Yankee farm system. Right? So he goes to George Steinbrenner and he tells that George had this great new stadium and it's going to be these great new Bears. And this is an explicit attempt by Cerrone to build on the nostalgia of the old Yankees to build a connection with the Yankee fans we know are in the area. In fact, it has been rumored that the Bears sold, the Bears were sold by the Yankees because they didn't want the competition. And loyalty held, because when the Bears left, most converted their love to the Yankees. So you have Yankee fans here. Steinbrenner said he wasn't interested in minor league baseball, and then he put a minor league team in my hometown, Staten Island, a year later. So, New York, Staten Island Yankees. As with the building of the Prudential Center, the reputation of Newark as a dangerous city has been blamed for fans not coming from the suburbs to support teams based in Newark. And the same is thought to be true for the Bears. Without the New York Yankee affi affiliation, they become an original member of the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball, which is primarily composed within teams from New Jersey, which consistently outdraw the Bears. Um, since then, the Bears have recently moved to a Canadian division so that they can have a shorter schedule, so they can schedule more community events within the stadium to try to make some money back. In 2003, Cerrone sold the Bears, and the list of owners and subsequent court and bankruptcy cases after that sale is way too long for me to list here, but incredibly entertaining. Um, and needless to say, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride. So why hasn't the purposeful invocation failed to hold any residents within Newark? Next slide, please. So in a predominantly African-American city, maybe residents don't want to see the Bears, a name they could associate with a white team. Eagles players are memorialized in the ballpark, but equal recognition was not part of the original plan. The original name for the stadium was simply Bears and Riverfront Stadium. 
It took three years for them to change the name so that it included the Eagles. And the Ring of Honor that you see here does include um, Eagles players, but that was only dedicated in 2007. So that must be it. There is our problem. We're invoking all the wrong memories. But I believe there's more powers here than just a name when trying to figure out why fans have not embraced the new Bears. Rick Cerrone had intended with his team and his stadium to invoke the memory of the Bears of his father's generation, of his father's childhood neighborhood where Bears broadcast echoed through the streets where kids were playing stickball. The torchbearer of those Bears are not filling the stadium. So we try on another memory, one of the Eagles, with a legacy of black heroes, of a segregated team that was arguably better than their white counterparts, despite not having their resources, a championship team, one that was more accessible to the community, over a decade later and each year brings less and less fans. With all that said, all I can think was the city was willing to pay $34 million for a memory. Did they bet on all the wrong ones? Eminent Newark historian and generally amazing human being, Clement Price, <laughs> describes Newark today and quote, a city that over the last 50 years became increasingly disjointed. Its civic culture was extremely compromised. The riots took its toll on the city with respect to neighborhoods and a sense of cohesiveness in the city, end quote. The memory of Rupert Stadium has far less to do with baseball than it does with the community it created, both within the walls but within the actual neighborhoods. Baseball, the teams, the stadium, those were the community connectivities. When using memory for profit, one must make sure you type the right mystic chord. Memory built this stadium. The memory of a segregated city in the era of Jim Crow, the memory of riots, the memory of white flights to the suburbs, the memory of violence and crime that the city just can't shake, the memory of community, and of course, the memory of a stadium being in everybody's neighborhood. Memory built this stadium, but it cannot fill it. Stadiums, I believe, Rupert Stadium fits into this category, are often referred to as temples, cathedrals, churches. They are often considered sacred sites and spaces. Stadiums earn this reverence in part because the experience they offer, and it is through that experience that a community is solidified. The emotions invoked in a stadium can range anywhere from communal elation to despair. Together, you are all participating in the rituals of the game. Together, you are all concerned and working towards a common goal, a win. Stadiums are special, and you can learn a great deal about a city through its stadium and its fans. At least I hope you can. Through the fans, we can see what is valued in society by what is repurposed or reproduced within the, within the fans community. Stadiums are standing imprints of a city's history, a way we can trace the many layers of a city's past. What I spoke about today is a small part of the narrative I hope to write. I am at the very early stages of my project, and I hope you will give me some feedback, because I know there's people in the room who can. What I hope to do with my larger project is chart the history of Newark through its relationship with Rupert Stadium. Using the idea of placed memory, the ability for space to function as an entryway into the past, I would like to try to understand how Rupert Stadium functioned as both a public and community space, but also as a personal space where identities were shaped and formed. How stadiums function as a site of personal, collective, and social memory, and how I can translate those memories into the history of the city. By using the stadium and the community of fans that grew from it, I would like to see how the world outside the stadium, the social and cultural changes that were occurring in the early 20th century, were playing out inside the stadium, and how that interplay allows for greater understanding of Newark's history. Thank you very much. have to just bear with some very brief comments uh, from me um, and then uh, some Q&A. Thank you to uh, Elizabeth, Samantha, John, and Laura. Obviously, excellent, excellent work. Where do I start with my comments? First, a quick comment on what these papers are not. Where are the 18th and 19th century dissertations? <laughs> Tim Christ would kill for a 17th century one. So would Gail Malmgreen, the driving force behind the Newark Archives Project. There are so many good topics to explore before 1900. If there are any students here now, please consult the Archives Project before settling on a topic. Clement Alexander Price has said over the years that this city has seen every conceivable urban narrative. 
Newark changed from a small farming village in the 17th and 18th centuries to a bustling industrial city in the 19th. And during the 20th, it changed yet again from a prosperous metropolis to a struggling city facing a trio of issues, deindustrialization, suburbanization, and old age. Tonight, at the dawn of the second decade of the 21st century, we have heard four impressive contributions to that long and complicated narrative. We began with Elizabeth Miola Aaron's work on the city's progressive era attempt to use local history to make better citizens. The Newark study was the first of its kind and was largely spearheaded by two great Newarkers, John Cotton Dana and Frank J. Airflar. Amid a growing list of urban ills like immigration, disease, and poverty, the making of the study highlighted a city's attempt to construct a usable past in order to build civic virtue. Notably, it preceded the city's 250th anniversary in 1916. Aaron's examination of what Newark has taught in the classrooms a century ago informs what the role of local history can be today in this era of considerable school reform. I've told her that she has to finish this dissertation in the next two years in time for the city's 350th anniversary in 2016. Thanks for putting that out there so publicly. <laughs> You'll thank me. <laughs> Samantha Boardman tells us of her discovery and subsequent mining of a treasure trove of oral history. It is an especially noteworthy discovery because it brings additional voice or voices to Dr. Price's seminal work on Newark's African American community from World War I through the late 1960s. The audio clips, as we heard, speak to the power of oral history from the mundane to the monumental. In particular, one of Borden's selections highlights what the historian Tom Chagru talked about in post-war Detroit. Quote, residents carried with them a cognitive map that helped them navigate the complex urban landscape, unquote. Newarkers then and now carry these mind maps with them, especially as they negotiate contested space, whether downtown or in one of the city's neighborhoods. John Johnson Jr. regaled us with a fascinating case study of how developers constructed a middle-class haven in order to stem what comes to be called white flight before and after World War II. He documents how federal housing policies played out on the local level, but also how the contrasting visions of two men, Louis Danzig, Newark's version of Bob Moses, and Lee Johnson, of the, recently, uh, the gnome de plume of the recently deceased historian Stanley B. Winters, impacted neighborhood transition in what he calls a troubled Eden. The weak wake section, and we see parallels to Aaron's work here, was created during the Progressive Era and was seen as a residential antidote to urban ills of slums, disease, overcrowding, and declining schools. In the post-World War II era, Johnson provocatively sees the creation of buffer zones as part of a Cold War residential containment strategy. Laura Troiano battled, batted cleanup tonight. <laughs> and, uh, she utilized the lens of our national pastime to examine race, memory, and public space in Newark. She reminds us that sport is not disconnected from the larger social and cultural conflicts of our human nature, and that baseball is not mere amusement. Baseball matters in the same dynamics that attract scholars to more traditional subjects engage scholars who study sport. Specifically, she depicts Rupert Stadium as a shared and even sacred space during an era of segregation. She also examines the stadium's legacy, what it means for the reincarnation of professional baseball in Newark. In comparing and contrasting Rupert Stadium with Newark Bears and Eagle Stadium, she, almost, she also comments on post-riot politics and urban development. We'd like to use the remaining time for some questions to our panel of new historians.
in the ironbound section of Newark. They were going to take over Riverbank Park and destroy 50% of the land, uh, open space in Riverbank Park. And we, we fought that uh, tooth and nail. We were even sold out by our councilman at that time, Hank Martinez, who wanted to build the stadium, and he was paid $36,000 to uh, promote the stadium. And upon this turnover of the first shovel of dirt when they were building that stadium, he was going to get another $75,000. Um, we were in danger, we were worried that they would go into the stadium, into the park one night and just destroy it, which they could do. Uh, uh, I'm, um, Mr. Johnson over there, when he was showing the um, uh, Weak Wake Park, I remember that racetrack. That, that was their, wow. The county went in and destroyed that racetrack overnight. That's what we were worried about, uh, what happened to uh, uh, Riverbank Park, and that was the, the danger of what was happening in Newark and what does happen in Newark. And the, we fought not only our city councilman, we fought Rick Cerrone who wanted that, and we also fought our Mayor Sharp James at the time to uh, save Riverbank Park, which we, we do now. And we've managed to finally get the extension done of Riverfront Park, which is under progress now, uh, they, the county completed its part up by uh, Grill Street, and now uh, across from uh, Riverbank Park, the city is completing its section uh, over there. But that's, I don't know if you encountered all that, you yeah. see the, uh, that was the long fight that we had with the Save Our Park there. Sam. Well, first I want to congratulate my four speakers. It was just a terrific evening, really. of a time when I, I was doing some work in the city on behalf of the rebuilding of Symphony Hall. And I approached, at that time, the impresario, who's, he's, I can't remember his first name, his, his last name happened to be Booker also, uh, a local person who, who was doing the, the bookings for Symphony Hall. And I, I was asking him something, and he said, I can only bring people to Symphony Hall the first three days of the month. After that, the welfare check is gone, and there's no money left in the city. And I can't help but think of that in terms of the baseball games. And there's no, there's, there's no economy to bring people with, with uh, excess money to go to see a ball game. Uh, I, let me reiterate um, my enormous enthusiasm for the uh, four wonderful papers. Uh, I was chancellor when we were talking about the PhD in American Studies uh, with a focus on cities and Newark and um, race and ethnicity, and I never dreamed that the outcome would be as spectacular as what I heard tonight. So congratulations. Thank you. Two quick questions. Uh, first, uh, for John, um, I thought you did a splendid job of explaining all the different forces at work in the transformation of Weak Wake. Uh, but we also know, and Newark is not unique in that way, we also know that there was a, an American tendency to want to go further and further out, to have more and more land. Ken Jackson and others have uh, documented that. So I'd just be curious about how you balance that uh, against all the other things you've talked about. And then let me just give Laura uh, my question. Uh, Laura, uh, my impression certainly is that Sharp James wanted to build anything, any place, anywhere. <laughs> that it didn't matter because he was so convinced nobody would build in Newark that building anything anywhere was fine. Does that factor into your I know every mayor of Newark the last 50 years. Anything, anywhere, at any cost. Thanks so much, Dr. Banner, for your question. Um, 
in my research, what I discovered was that a number of Jewish families actually wanted to stay in Weequake. There was the pull to the suburbs. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of the Third War Jews uh, in the early 20th century, a lot of them leapfrogged Newark, uh, leapfrogged Weequake, and went out to South Orange, Maplewood, um, into those communities, into Livingston, even even to Short Hills. Um, Bill Ross' novel, Goodbye Columbus, he talks about the families that went on out to Short Hills. And so there was that pull of, uh, there was a suburban pull. But in addition to that, there were a lot of people that had vested interests in the community. There were a number of synagogues still there. There were a number of businesses that were still there. Beth Israel was still there. Um, people wanted to remain in the community. You notice in, 19, in 1955, the Jewish Community Co Council, uh, there was an interesting meeting that occurred there where you had these different voices, some arguing things that sounded reminiscent of neighborhood improvement associations in Chicago, but then there were some that wanted to maintain an interracial community. They said, we want to stay here, want my children to be raised uh, in a diverse community. Um, and so I think there are uh, multiple forces. I mean, it's a very complex story, um, but I think suburbanization was one pull, but I think there were a lot of people that still had a, a love for, for Newark. I think that you're absolutely right, that he was definitely willing to build wherever it, it was that he could build. Um, I think that also setting the stadium in downtown Newark right by the Prudential Center with the support of Rutgers, with the support of NJPAC, but also with the demolition of the Lincoln Motel, the rent by the hour sort of motel that gets destroyed, that used to occupy that space. Um, those were kind of the primary people are willing to come into a downtown, whatever the downtown is. So if you're gonna try to attract people from perhaps Montclair, who actually have their own team, they might come in to um, Newark Penn Station to go to Prudential. So it was kind of seen as, let's kind of continue to build this downtown. The success, including Symphony Hall, has been sporadic at best, but I think that that kind of was the, the thinking. Um, if it wasn't gonna be the Ironbound where you have a community already in place, then, perhaps a downtown where people might be willing to come in. Hey everyone, I would just want to thank the uh, presenters. It's really gratifying to see younger people so committed to the study of history and applying its lessons to Newark. Uh, I think Malcolm X once said, history is a subject best suited to reward our studies, and tonight is certainly evidence of that. Um, I really enjoyed uh, being a former member of the school board here in Newark Advisory Board. Uh, I found Liz's presentation ruefully illuminating <laughs> um, <laughs> Samantha, your presentation was really fascinating because at least something came out of the botched attempt to rehab Kruger Scott Mansion. Mm -hmm. And um, the, um, I did have a question for uh, John. Mm -hmm. uh, have you yet in your studies looked at the impact of the proposed crosstown connector that would have connected 78 and 280 and the impact that had on the central ward? That's certainly is a huge, uh, a huge impact on the city, the quality of life in that area. Uh, again, uh, Ms. Troiano was very entertaining, and I, I agree with you completely that, well, well I, I might amend your the issue that, remember he built that stadium? I think a lot of dollar signs still did too. So. And thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the Ford Great Students for four great papers, which was great evidence of all the hard work you put in. My question is really for Elizabeth. I was fascinated by how this bird's eye drawing exercise appears both in the progressive era and today. And yet if you look at the political ideals that are being evoked in the short history of Newark, they're about labor, self-improvement, self-sacrifice, progress. These are 19th century ideals. They're not 20th century ideals, however much I find them attractive and impressive. So my question is this, what happens to progressive educational ideas depending on the different political contexts that they're expressed in. What do they mean in the Newark of 1913 and the Newark of 2013? Because the ideals of education are still around, but I think the political system and the social setting of its schools is very different today. What do you think that might add up to? I really get to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy knows I have some answers to that question. <laughs> Gosh, where to begin? You know, in 60 seconds or less, um, I actually thought you were asking a different question. You threw me when you mentioned 2013. 
I thought you were asking about kind of how how do the, the like if we use the bird's eye view as an example because it's such an easy example and it's right at the beginning of the NORC study. Um, it's very dewy. It's very progressive. It's very let's move. Let's go upstairs. Let's think about what interests the children. Let's have the children execute the project that will interest them, but yet teach them about their city. And and it's very um, to use the phrase. It's very macro and micro. You know, it's very let's look at the whole city, but let's also help the child understand his neighborhood, which is why. Uh, Kennedy proposes it as an activity, is to give them a sense of where they are on that, quote, skeleton map as it relates to that nine-foot map, which I'm kind of fascinated by. <laughs> to your other question about politics and education, um, I think politics determines even more than most people think it does what gets taught and how it gets taught. Even more important than those two things I think is the issue of how politics, either in 1913 or 2013, is allowed to determine the value of what gets taught, especially in a for-profit education economy. I'll leave it at that Stop. for now. We're going to have two more questions. Dr. Herman, and then we'll go with one last one. Yeah, hi, I, I just wanted to say, like everyone else, I really enjoy all four presentations. I, I just have a couple of questions. One is for John um, about the, 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 the changes that happened in Weequay in the mid to, to late 1960s. And I'm curious that you didn't say anything about blockbusting, particularly about the Jordan Barris company and, and their history. And I wanted to hear maybe a little bit more about in your response to a previous question, you said that some Jews wanted to stay, others felt like they had to leave, and, and I was kind of curious, was there a sense that, that, you know, that racial fears were part of the equation, that not only did, did Jews want to, to have a bigger piece of land out in the suburbs, but to what extent was that kind of fear of racial change a factor in the, in the transition that happened in, in Weequay? And my other question has to do about baseball, about the two stadiums. Um, were the audiences always completely different? Like, were the Eagles games attended all, only by African Americans, or did whites actually go to watch the Negro League's games? And vice versa, did black folks in, in the city actually go to the stadium to, to catch a Bears game from time to time? Were those audiences ever, did they ever mingle, and did it become more of a communal space instead of a segregated space? Um, yes, there, it wasn't officially sanctioned as a segregated space, so there was an allowance. Um, Effa Manley talks about in her autobiography, if you saw a handful of white people at an Eagles game, that would be a lot. The same was true for the Bears. Um, Jerry Eisenberg, an interview I did with him, he says that he attended the Eagles games regularly as a kid, would kind of climb up on the wall, um, the whole not whole gang, where they would there's a you know a wolf's head uh, billboard sign, and there was a hole in there, so they'd climb up on the billboard and look through the hole so they could see the game for free. So you did have some mixing, but the sense of community wasn't there. The community was around the fact that everybody loved baseball, not necessarily that everybody loved their team. Um, and I think that is one of the interesting dynamics is it was an inclusive space when you were there, but it was an inclusive space when you were within the city. So stuff that I'm working with. Tonight's talk was, uh, I guess, a 15-minute discussion of a much, much larger uh, piece of work. And so um, I do address the issue of uh, racial animus for flight from week Um One of the things I noticed, and I, I really wanted to talk about what I did tonight, because, forgive me for quoting Bible verse, but I have to look at the book of Ephesians. And there's this one passage where they talk about the armor of God. And most people I've heard talk about that they focus on that, but they missed the part before that where there's a talk of where they say we, um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, uh, powers above. And so I'm very conscious of the fact that people make decisions based on the environments that they're in, that racial animus does exist because there are those tensions there. But oftentimes people are reacting to things that they've been taught, things that they've learned over periods of time. And so I'm very careful because Weequake is a, is, a, is a cultural artifact, and people have a particular memory of it. 
and I want to maintain that to a degree. Because um, there will there'll be some people that will say, well, everything was fine. We loved each other, but why'd you leave? And so I, I'm very careful about getting into that space. Um, part of that is because individuals like Jordan Barris hired uh, African-American men to sell homes to African-Americans. And then when black families moved in, some Jews picked up and they moved further into weak way closer to Maple Avenue School. And so you see the areas around Peshan, Ave Peshan Avenue School was in like 1955 was a fairly mixed community. But by 1963, it was virtually all black. Um, and so this trend continues over time. People picked up because they recognized that, and Norton talks about this, we want to distance ourselves. But then there were others who said, I want my children to be raised in an interracial community. And so I'm very careful about going into that space because we, people say you're racist, you're racist, you're racist. And I think that becomes just an all-embracing term that really lose, you lose sight of a lot of different things that are going on. Because to be sure, middle class black folks also packed up and left too for some very interesting reasons as well. And so um, I don't want to necessarily absolve folks who you know, had a certain word in mind when they left Weequake, an N-word to be sure. But at the same time, I also want to make sure that we're true to you know, people want to live in a safe neighborhood, and when they when the riots occurred, a lot of people were scared. My mother, God bless her soul, she was up here as a 16 year no 15 year old girl babysitting her her nieces and nephews, uh, just for the summer. Had to lay, you know sleep on the floor at night and went back home. Mom, I was in a riot. I don't believe what happened, but then decided in 1969 after graduating high school to come back up here and live. And so there was obviously something about Newark that drew her here, and besides just getting a good job. Um, and so I appreciate your question. Yes, I will explore that a little bit more. Uh, look out for it. Then I'm going to cheat. Uh, woman behind Gal Malgreen, and then Gail can close the meeting because she's involved with uh, all these archive projects. So last question. Thank you. And then please talk to the speakers afterwards. Uh, they'll be here to field your question. Hi, I'm Charlotte Chapel. I'm in a graduate course at another university, starts with a B, and it's in Madison. <laughs> <laughs> Many of my fellow students um, in historic preservation are amazed at what I have to say about Newark. And I, I'm just curious what your friends and family are expressing about your interest and your research and your delving into the work. Quick fire answer, yes. And, and I'm so sad that my parents couldn't come this evening because that's really my answer, which is, um, as Tom said in my introduction, I have been coming here since I was little. I, I don't live that far, but, um, but my, uh, my grandfather came in 1907 or thereabouts. Um, as a preteen, basically. So it's very personal to me, so my family is not remotely surprised. As I said, I spent Saturday mornings sorting carpet tack nails on Shipman Street for no pay. Um, <laughs> coffee or something, I don't know. Um, so my family's not surprised. Um, my friends are not surprised as well, I think those who know me. Um, I believe that the place is very important. I've always taught, when I taught high school, I taught local history. I think it's absurd to think that you, you don't need to interest your students in where they are. So that is probably the more important answer for me, which is this Nork study really thinks Nork is important. And there's lots to be said about why and how. But I think that that's the best way to teach, which is value where the children that you're working with are. Like, what is this place and why is it important? We should learn about it. And, and you can't do American history anywhere as well as you can do it in the city of North. So that, for me, that's it. And then they say I have too many words on my slides. <laughs> Samantha, do you want to? Ask? Um, I'm, I'm not originally from uh, Newark. I'm from Maryland. And when I was accepted into Rutgers, I didn't know anything about Newark at all. Um, I had never heard of the Newark riots. So, I, yes, I had never heard of Newark riots. So I came into the history of Newark, and I came into the city with an absolute blank slate and no expectations about what I would find. And having the just great good fortune to come across an archive of Newark history and African American history and American history that's just so rich and so vivid. Like, I defy anyone to listen to these conversations and not just get chills and, and want to hear more because it's like eavesdropping on, on these historical conversations and it's marvelous. And I, 
I just wish that I, I could have played you more. I mean, the, the, the anecdotes talk about, um, one man says that his mother always told him that she was not going to go on the state because uh, she was too proud. And on the state was what they, they called welfare. And he said you could tell the kids at school who were on the state because they all had the same glasses. I mean, that kind of personal anecdote, that just makes an historic and, and <coughs> social issue just so much more relevant. And he's talking about this childhood recollection. And there's an interview with Sharp James, and he talks about, uh, it's three hours long, and it's just... <laughs> <laughs> But it's stunning, and he, he, one of his recollections is being in high school, and he was academically and athletically gifted, and he was denied a letter, uh, just out of just sheer racism, and they talk about the banality of evil, and this was one of the, the, the small slights in the banality of just senseless racism, and it made such an impact, and you have to think, he was just a kid, he was just a high school kid, and he earned it, and he should have gotten that letter, but he didn't, and he remembered it into his adulthood, and... Uh, and there's, just one more thing, there's a woman who talks about coming up from Florida and she got a job in a factory and she had to learn how to drink coffee because she was always cold in the morning because it was just so much colder here. And so just like this, this like reconditioning of, of her life and herself and having to learn to drink coffee to, to embrace this new environment. This is amazing stuff and it's important and it deserves to be preserved and it deserves to be disseminated and people deserve to hear it and these people deserve to have their stories heard. And I have chills right now just even thinking about it. And you know, anyone that, that would say that that was not worthwhile doesn't know what they're talking about because it's <laughs> marvelous. Newark or anywhere else. Um, I, actually sitting here thinking about it, it's actually in this building that I first came across Newark history. Um, Maureen O'Rourke gave me a tour of the archives and showed me New Jersey's birth certificate and introduced me to Longies Wilman, um, and he became the topic of my master's thesis. Um, and now here I am doing my dissertation on Newark history again, and I think my family and friends are not surprised that I've embraced my second new hometown. I spent enough time here. So I think they're all very excited, and like Sam and Elizabeth and John, we're just really passionate to be telling a history that hasn't been told before and have that opportunity, and to do it in a city that I think we've all really embraced. So we thank you for the opportunity to do that. Tom's known me since I was a high with a high top fade, and so... Uh, They're coming back. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Um, going to St. Benedict's Prep, we were tasked with representing Newark. Um, as a member of the, my high school fencing team, there were 37 of us who were black, two were white, and we would go out and fence majority white teams, if not all white teams. And we dealt with some stuff when we went out there. First time I got called, nigga, was when I went out fencing. And so in a lot of ways, I've been representing Newark for a very long time. Um, and, I, and I love the city, and I love the, the history. The other part of it is I'm very mindful that with time, as time passes, so do people and so do memories. And my grandfather taught me a long time ago, the hard way, that sometimes you have to sit and listen to make sure that you get something. Because if you don't get it, you're going to make the same mistakes I made. And so... More than anything else, I just want to, th my family just loves to tell me stuff. My friends that, that know I'm doing this regular love to tell me stuff because it gives them an opportunity to tell stories that nobody else really care about, so, or nobody thinks to care about. Gail, thank you. Everyone, this is Gail Malmgreen, who's uh, in charge of the Newark Archive Project, among other folks. Amazing, amazing presentations, and one of the things that makes them so wonderful is they raise so many interesting questions. They're not early, but they're great topics, I have to say. You know, someone else will do maybe the 18th and 19th century. But they just raise these fruitful, wonderful questions in my mind, more than could possibly be answered now. But I'm thinking, for example, maybe does John Cotton Dana loom too large in our memory of progressive era in Europe, and how does the image and imagery of Dana accord with the reality of progressive era in Newark? Interesting question. Uh, I'm going to get back to the oral histories. Laura, you know, uh, where does gender come into it? Effa Manley aside, Laura aside. Uh, how about the impact of television in the shadow of the Super Bowl? You know, what does that do to the ability of a stadium to be anything? 
uh, more questions about Leucoid in my neighborhood than I could possibly list. But I just have one sort of quick answerable question, and that's for Samantha. And I would like to know those interviews are as great and greater as you described them. Um, Amari Baraka's father is in there. They're just amazing people, wonderful interviews. When are they going to be publicly available? And how is that going to be done? That's my question. Uh, that, that's an excellent question. We've been working on the archive with Tim. We've been working with the library. We hope to do something. But you know, I can I can say I can say something on that. Um, yeah, we, we were uh, hoping that the uh, that, that Rutgers would would make them public. Um, they are on a hard drive at Rutgers now due to your efforts, Samantha. Thank you very much. And uh, and we were thinking of, at the New York Public Library, we we're thinking of putting them on a hard drive, but that. That would be very hard for the user. So early last month, I spoke to James Lewis in my department, and uh, he agreed that uh, he's going to get together with the people at Rutgers and transfer the, the maybe onto a hard drive to us. But then we'll put them on a series of about 10 DVDs, and we'll, we'll probably just make people sign something, as Gail suggested to me, just sign something saying that they're not going to use it for commercial use and rather than make people sit in the library and listen for 30 hours or something, we'll just duplicate a DVD and hand it to them. So uh, I, I do, uh, James is very busy right now doing the uh, Philip Roth birthday bash uh, exhibit for March, but as soon as he's finished with that, we'll try to get, uh, get working on this. So all good things. Lots of uh, side conversations, I'm sure, afterwards. I I want to end with two quick things, if I may, Tom. Um, one, uh, John, I, you make me very happy that one of the quieter things that we did as the Newark History Society was to uh, preserve Stan Winter's papers. He was ready to throw them away. Uh, the, all his binders related to the Clinton Hill um, Improvement uh, Group are at the Newark Public Library. The rest of his papers are here at the New Jersey Historical Society and uh, we arrange for them to be uh, sorted and cataloged so that they are accessible. Uh, the second, March 18th, uh, we are going to have a program uh, moderated this uh, time by Gail Malmgreen on three pioneering black women in Newark, Mary Birch, uh, two pi pioneering black women and one Hispanic, uh, Dr. E. May uh, McCarroll, uh, and then um, uh, from the Hispanic Hilda community, Adago. Hilda Hidalgo. So those are the three that we're going to have uh, speakers on March 18th, again, here at the New Jersey Historical Society. If you want to hear about it, if you want to get one of Bob Hartman's flyers, make sure that we're, you're on our list. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>